Esther chapter 1. Uh, remember, everybody, you want to record and, li not record, but like and share the video as much as possible. So, okay. Let me get off that. All right. So let's take a look at Esther chapter 1. Now Esther uh, chapter 1 is taking place in the year of 483, specifically more in the fall of that year. It is, uh, this chapter takes place over a six month period. Xerxes is the ruler of 127 provinces and it's very important to note that one of those provinces is Israel, okay? So when we talk about the provinces of Israel, or we talk about things going out to the provinces, Israel is one of those provinces. It's part of the kingdom of Persia. So this is taking place in 483. It is taking place in Susa. And Xerxes is putting together a war council. That is the purpose for this six-month-long period, or the 180 days. And so he's putting that together. So let's start by reading out of verse 1. I'm in the complete Jewish Bible. Okay. These events took place in the time of, and I'm going to call him Xerxes because it's easier for me to say, time of Xerxes. The Xerxes who ruled over 127 provinces from India to Ethiopia. You see that? That would have included the land of Israel. It was in those things days that King Xerxes sat on his royal throne in Shushan, or Susa, the capital. This is his winter capital. Okay. In the third year of his reign, that's how we know it's 483 B.C., that he gave a banquet for all his officials and courtiers. The, the army of Persia and Medea, the nobles and the provincial officials were in attendance. So his military is there. That is also another clue for us that this is his... Uh, war council, his, his strategy, big strategy meeting before he goes off to war with Greece because we know when that happens. Okay, So this is taking place right before he goes and so he's getting everything together and all the support he needs for this big campaign. Uh, verse 4, he displayed the dazzling wealth of his kingdom and his great splendor for a long time, 180 days, okay? Um, okay, I think we're okay at the moment, anyway. Um, my husband was just sending me a message. So it's 180 days or six months, okay? At the end of that time, the king gave a seven-day banquet in the courtyard of the royal palace garden for all the people, both great and small, there in Shushan, the capital. And so at the end of this big strategy meeting, right, that lasted for six months, he's like, we're going to throw a party for seven days, we're going to get ourselves together, we're going to get all rallied up before we go off and fight, so we're going to have this seven day long party, okay, there, in verse six, there were white cotton curtains, lost my place, and blue hangings fastened to silver rods with cords of fine linen and purple. The columns were marble and couches for uh, reclining at table were of gold and silver on a mosaic flooring of malachite, marble, mother of pearl, and onyx. Drinks were served in gold goblets with each goblet different from 
the others. There was royal wine in abundance, as befits royal bounty. The drinking was not according to any fixed rule, for the king had ordered the stewards to serve each man what he wanted. Stop there. So this is a very elaborate setting. Lots of curtains, probably pour, uh, proportioned off different areas where people could go rest, where they could eat, where specific groups could get together. So there's these different rooms and also they're drinking in abundance with no regard for necessarily Persian or Medean protocol when it comes to drinking. They're just drinking. They're getting themselves worked up to go off to war. They're getting themselves excited. They don't want anything holding them back because they're, they're fixing to go on this huge campaign. They're going on the attack. Okay? So they're getting all worked up for that. And they're throwing this big, huge party for that purpose. And then you have, in verse 9, Vashti, the queen, gave a banquet for the women of the royal house belonging to King Xerxes. So here we have the queen, Queen Vashti, giving a royal banquet herself for the women. So the men are with Xerxes, and these men's wives are with Vashti. And if you remember from our discussion last week with Xerxes' past, if you remember, there was a very powerful woman in the land of Persia. Her name was Atoza, Xerxes' mother. She is Cyrus's daughter. She was Cambius's wife. She was the fake Smyrtus's wife. She was Darius's wife who was Xerxes father okay Xerxes is her firstborn son with Darius so she is probably in attendance at this banquet with Vashti and remember I told you she used to hold her own court for the women when she was queen and people were still largely looking to her in terms of the women. But now this is fallen on Vashti. Vashti throws this big banquet. Her and Atoza are first cousins. Got that? Her and Atoza are first cousins through Atoza's mother and Vashti's father. So you have these first cousins. So Vashti, who's much younger than Atoza, is, is in many ways trying to outdo Atoza. Okay? So she's throwing this big elaborate party as she's trying to get the women prepared for their husbands going off at war. And it's also important to note that some of these women, including Vashti, were also fixing to go off to war. Herodotus lets us know that Xerxes, one of his most uh, trusted generals, so to speak, was someone very intimate with, with Xerxes. And it leads us to believe that it is, more than likely, Vashti. So Vashti was also a warrior in her own right, and she would be going off to war herself. But she is also, at this point in time, just given birth, or about to give birth, to Artaxerxes. Artaxerxes is the son who will reign after his father, Xerxes. So she's just right around that time of giving birth, right? So, she's not exactly probably feeling extremely beautiful, um, which is going to come into play. But also, there's 
other issues at play here. And it has to do with the fact that her father is from Medea, from the Medean line. Xerxes' father is Persian. Xerxes is Persian. Okay? And through his mother, through Atosa, Cyrus's line as well as the son of Darius. Got that? That is also at play here. So, let's continue. Verse 10. On the seventh day, when the king was in high spirits from the wine, he ordered Mehuman, Vitsta, Harvona, Bicta, Avakta, Zetar, and Carcass, the seven officers who attended him, to bring Queen Vashti before the king with the royal crown in order to show the people and the officials her beauty. For she was indeed a good-looking woman, but Queen, but Queen Vashti refused to come at the order of the king at the order of the king which he had sent through his officers this enraged the king and his anger blazed inside of him all right so he, she is sent for seven men come into her banquet and they tell her they tell her that the king wants her in his presence amongst the rest of the men with her crown on to show off her beauty now i'm sure some of you are aware that there are some who say that he was wanting her to come in with only her crown on okay well whether that's the case or not the case I don't think it was a matter of modesty on Vashti's part for her refusal. It might have been the fact that she was right around the time of giving birth or had just given birth. It might have also been the fact that she's fixing to go to war with these men and she may not want to present herself just as a beautiful woman if she's also a commander of part of the military. It may also be that as a Median, she is also trying to garner more power for her father's side of the family, Otain's side of the family, the Median side of the family. And we're going to see that in just a little bit because there's a little hint that that might be part of the problem when the solution is given by Mimukan. Okay? So she refuses to go in for whatever reason, whether it's the fact that she's right around the time of giving birth whether it's the fact that she's also a military commander and doesn't want to necessarily be seen in that respect when she's fixing to take some of these men to war. Um, she may not uh, also want to um, do that at the request of her husband because she's trying to garner more power for the Median side of the family. Okay, There are multiple things layers here that could very well be part of her decision making process. She might not also want to appear just as a tool of Xerxes in front of the women, especially Atosa, who was known for being such a powerful woman in her own right. She may be wanting to show her own uh, power within the kingdom, okay? Now, I know that it is, it is our typical 
um, default to feel sorry for Vashti. But according to Herodotus, she is not a modest woman who's just looking out for her modesty. She's not a dignified queen who, who just doesn't want to go have a bunch of men Google at her. That's not necessarily her issue. And we know that because Herodotus lets us know that this woman that we believe is Vashti, who goes off to war with Xerxes, and he doesn't call her a queen, which is important because if you remember, by the time they go off to war, she has been deposed as queen. Okay? So Herodotus doesn't call her queen, but he puts her pretty much right there. Okay, she's still very powerful. She has men under her own command. She's still having relations with Xerxes. Okay. This woman, who we believe is Vashti, within the religion of Zoroastrianism, which we will talk about next week, because I want to talk about that before we actually go into chapter 2. But she actually worships the god of the underworld within Zoroastrianism. She actually worships the enemy of the god of Zoroastrianism. So she is not a nice person. All right, that is very important for us to keep in mind. All right, now let's let's continue with Xerxes' reaction. Xerxes becomes very angry. Okay. The words that are used for Xerxes' anger in verse 12, both of them have a hint or a meaning of displeasure. Just outright disgust, anger, being livid, and hot displeasure. That is a very important thing for us. So you need to write that down. That both words that talk about his anger, his anger blazed, right? Within verse 12 of chapter 1, have that idea of just heated displeasure. Because again, we are setting her, and the book sets her, opposite of Esther. So whereas Xerxes has this hot displeasure and he's very angry with her, his attitude is going to be the exact opposite of that when it comes to Esther. And she will play with the idea of the opposite of that uh, in her relationship with him. Okay, how she addresses him, how she talks to him. Okay, so whereas the way Vashti treated Xerxes brought out his displeasure, Esther's way of treating him is going to bring out his pleasure. So that is something we want to look for in the book. One thing that Esther does time and time again is it's a book of reversals or opposites. Okay. All right, and so he's angry, very angry. In verse 13, it says, As was the king's custom, he consulted sages well-versed in matters of law and justice. Okay, he's so angry, he cannot even think for himself. He calls in his advisors, who are familiar with the law and justice and protocol of the kingdom. Okay, who does he bring in? 
with him were Karshna, Shatar, and Mata, Tarshish, Merez, Marsna, and Mimukan. The seven vice regions of Persia and Medea. who were part of the king's inner circle and were the most important officials in the kingdom. And where were they from? Persia and Medea. They were family members. Okay? These were the family members he trusted the most from both sides of the family to allow close to him. That is very important because behind the scenes of Xerxes, even within his own family, are constant conspiracies to get rid of him. And so these are the ones he trusts. These are family that he trusts. And it would not surprise me if these family members were recommended to him by his mother who has been in the intrigues of this family and this palace and this royal setting for many years, decades. And so she would know, even within the family, who could be trusted and who could not. Yes, I believe she was that powerful of an influence within the kingdom. Okay? So these are the ones that Xerxes trusts the most. And what advice do they give him? Verse 15. The king asked the sages, according to the law, what should, be, should we do with Queen Vashti since she didn't obey the order of King Xerxes conveyed by the officers she didn't obey me and how dare she not obey me what by law must be done there must be what we must do must go according to what has happened in the past through precedent or direct law so what is there we can do? I know I need to take this woman to war with me because I need her militarily because she's very skilled at what she does. She's a very powerful and skilled commander. But I am before my court, my men. I am acting as, queen, as king, calling upon the queen And she refused a direct order from her king to come into his court, basically. Okay? So, verse 16, Mimukan answers the king. Mimukan presented the king, the vice regents, this answer. Vashti, the queen, has wronged not only the king, but also all the officials and all the peoples in all the provinces of King Ahasuerus or King Xerxes. Okay? So not only has she wronged the king, but she's also wronged the other officials of all the peoples of all the provinces. Not even just the provinces of Persia and Medea. That's interesting. Right? And again, those provinces go from India to Ethiopia. So there very well could have been some people from the province of Israel sitting in that party, that court, that council. Okay. Verse 17. Because this act of the queen's 
will become known to all the women, you know, our wives who are sitting in her court, her chambers, her party, okay, so to speak, and so to speak, because these are more of courts and banquets than what we would today call a party, okay, so, and he's concerned that her behavior would, as queen, would become known to the rest of the noble women who are with her. This is a problem for them because remember, this is this these families, both from Medea and Persia, they intermarried with each other. So some Persians are married to Medeans, and some Medeans are married to Persians, and it just keeps going and going and going. Okay. And he's concerned that these women, their wives, will then start showing disrespect toward their own husbands. They will say, King Xerxes ordered Vashti, the queen, to be brought before him. But she wouldn't come. She refused the order of the king. Now, these other women... When their husbands tell them to do something or give them an order, so to speak, well, their husbands aren't the king. And if Vashti, the queen, can disobey the king, then surely these women who are independent-minded themselves can disobey their husbands who aren't even king. They may be nobility, but they're not king. Okay? So... That is his concern. Now, biblically speaking, is it important for there to be harmony in the home? Yes, there is. So on that level, that is a legitimate concern of Mimucan. Okay? But at the same time, remember that this is also a family that's not... Um, Oh, what's the word I'm looking for? Well, there's no lack of conspiracies within the family. Okay? Within the families. Going back and forth with each other. Okay? They're very familiar. That's what I was wanting to say. They're, they're very familiar with conspiracies. Okay? Even within households. Because a lot of these marriages were arranged. Most of them probably were. It's not like people are falling in love and deciding to marry each other. These were arranged by families to try to bring the families even closer together in that sense. So there is that concern of family harmony and of lack of conspiracies within the families. These are very, these were very real for them. Okay. So he's concerned about that. Um, verse 18, moreover, the noble ladies of Persia and Medea who hear of the queen's conduct will mention it to all the king's officials, which will bring about an end to dis to bring an end of disrespect and discord. About no end of disrespect. Thank you. <laughs> I skipped over that very small word. No, no end of disrecord of disrespect and discord, conspiracy, discord, disharmony. Um, right now, as things are right now, um, we've got things pretty much under control, right? And this could mess things up. Verse nineteen. If it pleases his majesty. If it pleases his majesty. So maybe Ken here is trying to calm Xerxes down and seek his pleasure instead of his heated displeasure. Okay? So if it pleases his majesty, let him issue a royal decree. And let it be written 
as one of the laws of the Persians and Medes, which are irrevocable. Hmm, that's interesting. Because scripture talks about the covenants of God being irrevocable. The calling of God being irrevocable, I should say. Right? Um, and of course, we know we're not supposed to add or subtract from the law of God. So we can't change it. Okay? So, Medea and Persia kind of had the same type of um, philosophy to a certain respect. Once the king gives an order, once a law is given, it's set. Okay? Which is very important for us to remember for later in the book, isn't it? That Vashti is no, is never again to be admitted into the presence of King Xerxes and that the king give her royal position to someone better than she. So she's losing the crown. She's losing her position as queen. And when it speaks of not coming into King Xerxes' presence, it's not talking about on a personal level. They've got three sons together. So it's not talking about that. It's not saying that she's getting kicked out of the palace. It means that she's not allowed into the presence of King Xerxes as queen at court. He was calling her forth as queen of Persia of the Mede Median Persian Empire. And she refused to come. So she is losing her position as queen and she can never again appear as queen at the royal court before King Xerxes. Got that? So, she loses that. But Mimia Kent also says something very important. Notice he doesn't talk about her not going off to war, not being one of his gen generals anymore. Um, that's not the issue. The issue at hand is her position as queen at the royal court. Because obviously her children are still heirs to the throne. Interesting. So she is being deposed in terms of her title. She's losing her title. Okay. And Mimia Khan says, let's find someone better. Who's more worthy than Vashti was. Okay. Someone better than Vashti. That is a very important statement. Because remember, Vashti and Xerxes were married before Xerxes came to the throne. Who else was married before he came to the throne? Xerxes' father, Darius. Matter of fact, Xerxes' father's Xerxes' father Darius and his first wife also had children. Okay. But when Darius comes to the throne, remember I was talking about that? He married five different women, one of them being Atoza, who he gives the title of queen, not his first wife that he was married to before he came to the throne. So, in essence, Darius married someone better than his first wife. More worthy of being queen than his first wife. More worthy, right? So, this sets the precedence, and this is the backdrop for Mimikin making this statement to Xerxes about finding someone more worthy or better. Right? And that's very important for us to remember. This is based on precedent from the life 
of Xerxes' father with his mother, who's still alive. And is in very much still in competition, at least in the eyes of the people, for the title of queen with the people. She's the queen mother at this point, but the people still love her. All right. And that is going to play a very important role when it comes to a Jewish girl by the name of Hadassah coming to the throne. So he's told to find someone more worthy. Verse 20, And when the edict made by the king is proclaimed throughout the length and breadth of the kingdom, then all wives will honor their husbands, whether great or small. Because king is not just about you and your household and your respect, but it's also about us as husbands throughout the kingdom who want to be the kings of our own palaces, of our own families, right? And so that word goes out. So everybody knows that she's lost that title, which again is very important because Herodotus does not refer to her, her as queen. Okay? Now, we get back a little bit to the possibility that part of Vashti's reason might have been a little bit, a little bit, a little bit of conspiracy. Okay? Verse 21. This advice pleased the king and the officials. So the king did what Mimukon had suggested. He sent letters to all the royal provinces, to each province in its own script, and to each people in its own language, that every man, here's the key, that every man should be master of his own house and speak the language of his own people. Now, that's out of nowhere. Isn't it? Yeah, they've been discussing, you know, the honor that a husband should get from a wife and that a husband should be the master of his own household, so to speak, and have that respect as head of the home. But what's this business about his language being the language of his home? It would not surprise me, based on this statement, if when Vashti sent her answer back to Xerxes, that she gave it in Median and not Persian. Because all of a sudden, the language of the house is important. That is why I said that there could very easily have also been the motivation of a little bit of conspiracy for Vashti. Trying to get more power back into the hands of her father's family, Otanes. Remember? And Otanes was the son of who? Darius the Mede. Darius the Mean from the book of Daniel. So Vashti is also a descendant of Darius the Mean, who was gone long before she was born. But something is afoot. And something doesn't quite smell right with just this idea of her wanting to be a modest woman. It doesn't fit. 
because there are too many other concerns that are being just briefly mentioned that seem to have no place unless something else was going on behind the scenes. Does that make sense? I hope I didn't throw you too much for a loop. But you have to remember we are dealing with ancient an ancient empire okay and they are not unfamiliar with conspiracy with assassination brother killing brother right cambius killed his brother smyrtus in secret nobody even knew about it right a fake smyrtus coming to the throne and putting the queen and locking the queen in the harem this is not a kingdom that is devoid of conspiracy darius xerxes own father came to the throne in a conspiracy against the fake smyrtus so no it would not surprise me if her answer went back to the king in Median, and if her answer was motivated from seeing herself more as Median than Persian and wanting to give her father's household back more authority. And maybe even take the throne from the Persians. Because remember, Cyrus had gone up and conquered the Medeans, who was his grandfather. So there's a lot more at play here than just the simple statements we're reading here in the scriptures. Because the scriptures, the book of Esther, again, like we said last week, has kind of given us the rest of the story that the average person may not have been aware of. The actual first hearers of this book might not have been completely aware of this. And this is the side of the, the story that God wants his people to remember. All the ins and outs of what's going on within the palaces of Medea and Persia weren't necessarily as important for his people to understand and know. But it is Esther's setting. And it is something that the first hearers of this book would have been familiar with and understood. So it's important for us to understand it as well. All right. That is all I have for today. Next week, I want to talk about Zoroastrianism. And you're going to be, if you don't know anything about Zoroastrianism, you are going to be shocked how much or how similar it is to Judaism and Christianity on many levels. Corrupt though it is, there are some similarities there that are very unique in the ancient East. And so we're going to take a look at some of those things, okay, next week. We'll discuss it. And again, remember, as we talk about this, and I'm sure I'll bring it up again next week, that Vashti actually worshipped the enemy of their god, the god of the underworld. Okay? So that would be an equivalent of her worshipping who we call Satan. within their culture and their religion. Okay. Very, very important for us to remember. But we're going to be taking a look at those things next week. I hope you've enjoyed this lesson. I hope you've learned something. And I hope that you uh, have, you, that you can pass it on. You feel like you can pass it on. So again, like and share the video with friends, with family, people you think might be interested. Because we are coming on the top, up to the time of uh, Purim, which this book, right, this book memorializes for us. 
So I hope you have a blessed day. I hope you have a blessed week. I will see you next week. And from Esther's Legacy and Restoration Fellowship, Shalom.